Hello everyone. We're just waiting for a few minutes to get started, but I wanted to get the video going now so that we were all set up and ready to go. I hope you were all doing well. It's really windy here today, but <clears throat> um, thankful to be able to get out and walk every day. It's been a rough past few weeks. I'm sure that you're all all feeling that way also. All right, well, it's three o'clock, so we're gonna get started um, because it's Friday, yay. And uh, I am here talking today uh, about contemporary chamber ensembles, nonprofits, grant writing, and of course, um, I would love to take your questions and answer your questions as much as possible rather than having you just hear me blab on about um, the group that I'm involved in. But of course, I'll share a little bit about that as well. Um, so please feel free at any point um, to comment uh, on the video. I hope I know where to find those comments and um, uh, questions. If there's anything I'm talking about that you'd like further clarification on, don't feel like you're interrupting um, or having to wait to the end of the presentation, um, just so that I can address things right in the moment. Uh, at any rate, um, my name is Jan Barry Baker, and uh, I am co-artistic director and saxophonist with contemporary music ensemble Bent Frequency. And Bent Frequency has been around since 2003, is based in Atlanta, and I became co-artistic director of this group in 2009, I believe, um, shortly after I moved to Atlanta. And I run this group with percussionist Stuart Gerber. And he and I are colleagues together at Georgia State University, uh, where the group is actually uh, an ensemble in residence. So before this, I had been involved in saxophone quartets, um, like many of you. Um, I had played in a couple of uh, smaller contemporary ensembles in Chicago before I moved here, but I had never been involved in a sort of collective, um, a modular type ensemble uh, of this size. Um, and with this kind of budget until I came here. And I had, and I'll say I had zero experience with writing grants, zero experience with um, <clears throat> actually being responsible for organizing concerts and programming. Um, I had performed in a bunch, but never been in charge of it. And um, that responsibility uh, comes with, um, it was a shock to say the least um trying to figure out how to program things you know two years in advance so that you could write the appropriate grants to be able to fund fundraise everything and pay everyone um was definitely a, a very steep learning curve um but i have really enjoyed uh learning all of these things from grant writing to um you know managing uh, a budget um to hiring, to contracts, to all of those things. So um, at any rate, uh, when I started working uh, with Ben Frequency, working with Stuart, um, that's when this group really took off because when we started working together to write grants um, and to fundraise for this ensemble, we were able to do much more than one single person was able to do at a time. So um, if I could offer any piece of advice to those of you who are interested in starting a chamber group or, um, you know, of any size or kind, but more specifically one who is going to establish a nonprofit status, that is to be sure um, that you are working with uh, collaborators who are as invested as you and someone who will uh, work on the grant writing process together. Um, a lot of organizations will have somebody in charge of grant writing, but like anything, you need to have someone to bounce your ideas off of. Um, we're most successful when we leave a lot of time to write grants, um, meaning we start the grant writing process and the narrative months in advance, and we're able to go back and forth um, on a Google Doc or what have you um, in, in really clarifying what it is that we're after. So before I get too deep into this, uh, I'll tell you first that a nonprofit or a 501c3 means that your business, and it is a business, um, is a certified public charity or nonprofit at the federal level. Um, so uh, this means that you're exempt from many um, 
you're, you're tax exempt and the money that is earned as sort of extra profits come back to the business to be reinvested um, into the business itself or its programs. So in other words, um, you know, people aren't profiting directly. I mean, people earn money from it. Of course, the musicians are paid, um, but extra money that is earned goes back into um, uh, funding the, the presentations, projects, education, etc. of the business itself. The great advantage to being a 501c3 is that you as a charitable organization can um, collect donations that are um, tax write-offs, whatever that means anymore, but uh, <laughs> they are uh, tax write-offs for people who want to make charitable donations and you are eligible for applying for grants. Um, without having a fiscal sponsor. And I didn't even know what in the heck a fiscal sponsor was when I first started this. But if you aren't a 501, your group could apply for grants if you had a fiscal sponsor, um, such as Fractured Atlas. Um, I'm trying to think of other fiscal sponsors. Feel free to type in fiscal sponsors, friends, if you think of any into the into the comment bar. But um, Fractured Atlas is certainly one of them. Um, churches sometimes will be a fiscal sponsor. People that have registered 501 um, status like uh, a larger center for the per performing arts, if you're going to partner with them, um, can also be your fiscal sponsor. So you can apply for grants in this way. And what this does is actually allows you to put on projects that are you know, much bigger than just um, GoFundMe projects, etc. Not that there's anything wrong with GoFundMe projects. And I'll talk about the importance of community buy-in in a second too. Um, at any rate, <clears throat> um, having 501 status allows you to apply for uh, these grants. And so what's most important is creating um, a mission statement for your organization that is clear and succinct and that is understandable by people outside of music. I can't emphasize that enough. Um, oftentimes people reading these grant applications are not artists and they're not musicians. Um, they are business people or they are managing um, some kind of grant uh, operation of some kind, whether it's a foundational grant or whether it is an actual arts grant. A lot of times they're not artists themselves and so what we don't realize is jargon is completely confusing when they're reading an application. So make sure that your mission statement is very, very clear in stating what it is that you aim to do and how and um, you know why your particular organization is uh, uh, important in serving the community that you're part of. Um, so I can, for example, give you um, Bent Frequency's mission statement. Uh, is, and this is the very succinct one, this isn't the full one we use for, for full grants, but the very succinct one is, Bent Frequency is an Atlanta-based, uh, uh, sorry, Atlanta-based Bent Frequency is the Southeast's premier contemporary music ensemble. Founded in 2003, the group brings the avant-garde to life through adventurous and socially conscious programming, cross-disciplinary collaborations, and community engagement. Committed to exploding marginalized programming in classical music, one of Bent Frequency's primary goals is championing, championing the work of historically underrepresented composers, music by women, composers of color, and LGBTQIA+. So that is our uh, brief mission statement that basically says we are dedicated to avant-garde music, we are dedicated to championing the music of historically underrepresented composers, uh, we are interested in socially conscious programming, cross-disciplinary collaborations, um, and being involved in our community. So we didn't tr we didn't get too deep into all of the various things that we actually provide education-wise, or you know the exact kind of programming that we do. But it does show how we are important to our community, and we are um, you know involved in serving underrepresented. Um, populations uh, within our community. <clears throat> so um, once you've created a mission statement that is um, clear and succinct, the next thing is working on um, your grant application and narrative using that very same advice. Explaining your project in the simplest of terms, um, the dates, the locations, having all of these things laid out in advance. Um, and you know sometimes things do change and grant agencies know that, but the idea is to look like you have a plan and that you've already made the arrangements for 
community partnerships or renting a space, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and um, explaining how what it is you are doing, um, what performance and educational events, what it is they mean to the community you serve. Meaning, you know, giving a concert for a concert's sake is great, and I'm all about you know music for music's sake. But granting agencies, especially ones that are um, county agencies, local government agencies, city agencies, they are looking for how you can bring something to the community, how you can not only expand your own reach, um, your own develop your own audience, but how that's a benefit to the community, meaning um, how you can, um, like I said, serve underserved populations, how you can bring together uh, multiple uh, parts of the community. Are you able to establish an ongoing relationship? Those kinds of things. Um, and they're looking for in-reach and outreach type programs. Again, I had not really heard these terms. I knew what outreach was, but I didn't really understand the difference between in-reach and outreach, but they are very different things. Um, based on whether or not you are bringing people to you or you're going out into the community to offer educational pieces of this. Um, at any rate, meaningful engagement with your community is the most important thing. Um, so those kinds of things take a minute to be developed and they should never be rushed. I, I can tell you that I, I've looked back at grant applications I've written and I've written a lot of them. Um, I can tell right away which of the ones we took a month to kind of go back and forth and write over a Google Doc and which ones, you know, we were clearly scrambling the night before to throw together. Um, very important to check for spelling mistakes and all of that, but um, you need to keep a constant voice in the narrative. You need to make sure that it's not full of jargon. Um, and like I said, to not repeat yourself and to be as clear and concise as possible. So if you leave yourself time, usually, you know, you can come back after a week and kind of clean up um, things and make it as simple as possible. Um, so um, where to look for grants? Where does one even begin searching for grants that you might be eligible for? And like I said, even if you don't have a 501, you can get a fiscal agent. So being becoming a 501 takes sometimes a lot of money. I know that um, certain groups, um, you know, have spent a lot of time. I think that uh, I can't remember who I was talking to. Um, oh, Runa Quartet was mentioning that they had recently become or had applied to become a 501 and studying tax code, etc. It's really um, you get really in the weeds in that kind of stuff. And I have to say, I'm thankful that Ben Frequency became a 501 before I came on board. But a lot of times the lawyers for the arts groups in your uh, in your state will provide um, complementary or um, legal services and can help you with these 501 applications. So while you'll fill these things out, they will provide legal advice to assist you in um, you know, reading through it and submitting things. But you know, it, it is worthwhile uh, trying to get a lawyer to help with applying for these applications. It's possible to do without, but just like um, immigration or anything else that has to do with um, uh, you know, these kinds of matters, sometimes having a lawyer look over them can just sort of help. Um, at any rate, uh, I know Georgia Lawyers for the Arts um, does offer services to help groups become 501s. Um, but um, you can do it yourself. It's just, it's, it's complicated and um, it can take up to a year to apply for these things. So you need to give time. But even if you're not a 501, you can use a fiscal sponsor um, to apply for these grants. There are also grants like New Music USA or um, I believe Chamber Music America. There's a number of them that don't require you to be a 501. You can be an independent artist, and that might be a good way to practice getting some grant writing experience. Um, but uh, where to start looking for these grants? I would say um, where we start looking usually is a place like Grant Station, and I can um, type these up on the video and provide them after the fact, but Grant Station is a good one. Grantspace.org um, has lots of tips and listings of grants. Um, Grant Watch, Americans for the Arts, 
uh, foundation center, the community foundation locator. Um, I'll type these up and, and list them for you um, uh, in this video so you have, have access to that. But these are places where you can look for grants for your particular organization. I cannot emphasize this enough, but it is really important to create your project, totally flesh out your ideas, and find a grant that works for your project. Do not go and find you know, a grant and try to cram your project into it. Um, it never works out in that way. Uh, you know, we know that there are grants out there for commissioning contemporary pieces. So, of course, next year we'll we'll think about it and plan to commission a composer that we want to commission. But, you know, if there's a particular grant that is, um, you know, only for Icelandic composers, don't change your whole Chinese New Year program into an Icelandic program just so that you can try to get it funded by a grant. I can tell you that it just never works out well. So there are grants out there for almost every different kind of project. You just have to search and that's a place to begin searching. And I know, I think that was um, Taylor asked that question uh, was, you know, what types of grants do you typically f apply for and how do you make your project fit the guidelines without sacrificing your ensemble's vision or mission? Yeah. And the answer is you don't. <laughs> you just don't. Um, there are things out there. Now you, like I said, you will see these grants and you will say, oh, hey, one time when we have, you know, one day when we have uh, something that has um, K through six education um, as part of this grant project, you know, let's keep that in mind. And if something ever comes up, um, we'll come back to that. And we've done that many times where we have found, um, you know, a, a grant uh, that we'll, we'll make a note of saying that's a really interesting one. And yeah, someday I'd like to do something with like found objects and kids in third and fourth grade. But this project is definitely not the one. It's far too complicated. But, you know, a year later, we'll come back and say, OK, there was that grant. Um, and we now have this project where we've created these percussion instruments. And now we're going to write the grant. But it really is important not to cram your project or change your vision or mission to fit a grant. It, it really, really, really is because it doesn't ever come off as sincere. Um, and if you don't believe in your mission and your project, no one else will. Um, it's really true. You can, you can see that I've sat on, on grants panels, um, you know, judging applications now because they always ask you to come back and volunteer to do it. Um, you know, when you're when you're not applying yourself or when you've received uh, the award and then you sit on the panel. But you can definitely tell when people have rearranged things to make it work and it doesn't usually work. So that's what I would say, um, Taylor. I hope that answered that question. Um, so Kevin Norton says, what is your opinion on working under possible umbrella organizations for tax purposes? So this would be like a fiscal sponsor. Is that, I'm assuming that's what you're talking about, Kevin. So um, <clears throat> you can um, most certainly partner with organizations or have an organization be a fiscal sponsor. Um, and sometimes even like through a university, if you have to work, happen to work for a university, you can have an organization that operates somewhat independently, but uses the nonprofit status of that university to write grants. And for those of you that do work at a university or are in university, you might check most places have a grant office and they will help you and guide you through the grant writing process. I can also say that English departments are really great in this respect in that they offer um, classes on grant writing. I wish more uh, business schools and music schools would offer such classes, but usually you can find something in the English department um, about grant writing. Um, or of course, if, they're, if they have um, a, an arts uh, management program, they may offer this too. But um, oftentimes though, you're competing against other things in the university. So for, for me, we did we did write a grant once through um, the grant office at Georgia State, uh, but the problem was we were also competing against the Rialto Center for the Arts, which um, 
you know, was also writing grants under the same 501 number. And the Rialto Center for the Arts is, you know, a, a much larger organization than we are. We're an under $50,000 in general um organization and they're you know in the millions of dollars and for whatever reason we ended up competing in the same pool uh, because we were under the same nonprofit number and it just didn't make any sense we had no chance of of winning this grant and and it was um yeah it was just silly so at that point we decided never to do that again we were going to write our own since we had our own 501 number but i do know that um uh people have been very successful using fiscal sponsors uh so it's definitely something I recommend, especially until you can get your own 501 number. So I hope that answers um, that question. Um, okay, so you're looking for grants. I gave you a few places to look for grants. Um, definitely, if you live in a large city, check out your um, city. Like, so for us, we have um, a mayor's office of cultural affairs, and we can apply for those grants every year. But there's also county grants. Um, so for Fulton County, um, Clayton County, all the different counties, they have arts councils also. Um, and then they have a whole entire Georgia Council for the Arts. So um, those are all good places to look. The arts councils in your state and then these um, nationwide grants programs, which also will list international grant programs too. So we've applied for grants in Ireland um, to bring in Jennifer Walsh, who came in and gave an awesome concert here. Um, like 10 years ago or something, and the Irish government, um, it was Culture, I Culture Ireland that actually paid for her to come in um, and spend a week here with us. So there's lots of grants you can find um, internationally too, from places like Grant Station or Grant Space. Um, so I, I said before that I would come back to um, the idea of community buy-in. And we're really big, our, my group is really big on community engagement because if the community isn't engaged with what you're doing, meaning actually interested, having a vested interest in the projects you put on, it's really hard actually to show granting agencies that what you're doing means something to the community. And again, like I said, art for art's sake is great. Um, music for music's sake is great and we all play a lot of those things but when you are writing grants and showing the importance of what you're doing from an educational standpoint from introducing your community to something new um, to um, you know a multi-disciplinary um, adventures that actually impact more than one arts organization meaning building the audience of multiple organizations at once um, it's really important to show those grant agencies that your community actually contributes as well. And I'll tell you, they really look for not only um, corporate or government uh, sponsorships or grants, but they look for foundation grants, which are totally different than governmental grants, and they look for private donations. So while, um, you know, GoFundMe or Kickstarter or any of those things, um, you know, we, we've all run them before. They're actually super important because those prove community buy-in. And the best ones to find are the ones that are matching programs. So if you can find, um, like Power to Give is a really great one. If you are eligible to create a Power to Give um, grant through your... Um, uh, like Council for the Arts in your in your um, state, I really recommend those because not only do you get to have discussions and back and forths on there with people in your community, your family, your friends, they contribute, but then you also get the matching money from the state. It really helps you to raise money quickly. And when you then go to apply for foundation or governmental grants, they see, wow, look at the number of people. And again, remember, it's the number of people that donate, not necessarily the amount they donate um, that they're looking for oftentimes. Um, so keep that in mind. You hear that too, like um, when radio stations are um, fundraising, like any amount counts and they want to see a $5 donation from 100 people rather than, you know, $50 donations from five people or whatever, because numbers actually matter. Um, it shows community buy-in and they all um, 
you know, want to see those, those numbers. Um, I missed this question. I'm sorry, Ben. Uh, how much competition is there for these grants? Are there grants that often do not get funded because no one applies? Well, you know, I've never been on a panel where grants weren't funded because no one applies. I think that typically in my experience, there are more applications than money, um, in most cases. And, um, you will just like anything, like any kind of competition, you will miss more than you win. Um, and you'll spend many hours writing these things and it feels like a lot of work, a lot of work and you get back nothing. And then you finally do a lot of work and you're like, Oh, $200. Great. Okay. $200, you know, but eventually it's $2,000 and then it's $20,000 and the better you get at writing these grants and it does take time to learn. Um, the better you get at doing it, the more success you'll see because your your mission becomes re more refined, your community engagement statement becomes more refined, writing a budget. Okay, there's a whole other thing. We'll get to that in a second, but wow, man, I thought I knew how to keep a Quicken account, but this really got me doing the budgets. That's something, but yeah, so I would say, Ben, depending on the grant you're writing, like if you're doing New Music USA, they'll tell you very, very specifically um, how many applicants and how many hundreds of thousands of dollars they have to give out. And sometimes ones like those, you're better off writing a small grant for a smaller project or asking for a smaller amount than a, like a ton of money for, you know, the, the biggest, best project you've ever come up with in your whole life. You're better to start off small because they have more of those under $3,000 grants. Um, so you can check out those ones where you build a website and, um, you know, can commission a composer or do something interesting. And the better you get at them, then the more money you ask. I would say that when you get to the ones where you're asking for a lot of money, you probably see fewer applications for those um, because of the amount of work that has to be put into them and the audit statements that are required once you get over a certain dollar amount. Like once you get up to, um, you know, typically earning more than $50,000 a year in grants, you're at a different sort of tax level there and you have to actually show accountant audits, which are very expensive. Um, so you probably have m less competition in those higher rungs or competition, I guess, from different kinds of organizations. Okay, so the matching grants, I mentioned that um, generating interest I think is also really great because the, the more people you reach the more your um, events actually reach your community the more you're able to branch out and so to continue building your audience and to continue showing that people will contribute to your fundraisers um, because you can only tap out the same people so many times right you have to continue building the audience so that you can continue to reach new and different donors. Um, so uh, let's talk a little bit about the grant writing um, process. And I mentioned before taking your time to write um, your narrative, to, to really have time to come back and visit it uh, multiple times is, is really important. But that budget, uh, let me give you one piece of advice here, and that is, um, whatever you do, make sure that your income exactly equals your expenses or that you have more income than expenses. That may sound ridiculous, like, of course, or really, why would you want to show that you have more income? So let me tell you where I'm at with this. So when I first started doing this, and I, I mean, it seems simple to me now, but at the time I kept thinking to myself, well, surely they're going to want to see that we, you know, barely have enough, or maybe we don't quite have enough so that they will give us the full amount that we're asking for. But we actually got denied for a grant once because I had tweaked the numbers slightly to show that, you know, we were short by maybe a hundred dollars. So they really needed to give us that full 5,000 that we were asking for. Um, and I didn't realize that I totally shot ourselves in the foot, but quite literally when you apply for a foundation, like I'm thinking the, 
Amphion Foundation or Ditson Foundation or Copeland Foundation. There's many foundational grants, but they basically want to see that you've thought the whole project through. You know exactly where all pieces of the puzzle and money are coming from and that by them giving you this grant, this project will make, if not earn a little bit of money. And they don't always want to see you earn money. It just depends on the grant, but it should definitely be a zero equals zero game. And so that's the one piece of advice I can give for those of you who haven't written a grant before and haven't done a budget before. Make sure that zero it's zero to zero. The income equals the expenses. Um, do not lose money on your projects, even if you're going to. Um, you know, you'll figure that out somewhere else. Also make sure that you are fully eligible for the grant. Read the rules thoroughly before you put in any work um, and make sure that you know exactly what eligible and ineligible expenses are. So typically, um, I mean, you have to read every grant itself, but typically anything to do with artists, travel, um, music, supplies, those kinds of things are eligible, but you really need to check um, to be sure, like if you're doing a reception, um, can you include alcohol? Can you include um, mm, rental of a separate facility that doesn't belong to you? There's many things you got to read the fine print um, on that, knowing that you can't pay off past debts usually with grant money. So you've got to read the, read the um, fine print on eligibility very, very carefully. Um, so going on from that, so budgets, um, narratives, I would say that if you want, you know, tips on how to write a great grant, if you go to grantspace.org, um, there's a bunch of links on there that will take you to various tips on writing, um, grants. And there's so many angles and so many things that, you know, are very specific to those grants that it's hard for me to say, here are the five rules for writing grants because they're they're each, you know, kind of their own their own animal. Um, but I'll reiterate again: it's really important to explain your project clearly and concisely with as little jargon as possible. I always have someone outside of my field, someone who doesn't know me. Uh, you know, so well, like not my husband, right? He's not a musician, but I, I try to get somebody who is, is, doesn't know me as well, but knows me well enough to actually ask the favor for, um, to read the description and make sure that they understand what the project is about. Okay. So we, we sometimes really don't realize what words we use that somebody outside of music or specifically outside of contemporary music wouldn't understand. If they can re repeat back to me what the project is about, I have done a good job of explaining um, explaining in that narrative. Uh, again, trying to have a balance as best you can between private donations, corporate or government donations, foundation support, um, and um, you know different kinds of grant agencies. They like to see that because it shows buy-in from your community, buy-in from your city, from your government, um, but the foundation piece of it is quite important. Um, government grants like to see that foundations support what you're doing. Um, balance the budget. Know the difference between eligible and ineligible expenses. And have a backup plan for when you receive less than you asked. Um, ask for the moon, but... Um, you know, you don't lie, but you, you need to ask for the most ideal situation. So ideally, we pay each musician $1,500 to play this concert because, you know, darn it, they're worth every dollar. But we know in reality that we're probably not going to get the full amount of this grant and we'll be able to pay them um a union wage. Um, so we never, we never, of course, go below union wage. That's the other thing too, is never, never cut corners on paying your musicians ever. Um, figure out other ways to cut corners, whether it's, you know, less rehearsal time or less um, uh, rental space or what have you. But anyway, ask for the moon, but make that contingency plan so that when you don't get 
all of the money you're asking for. Um, you, you know exactly how you're going to retool the project because most grants will come back to you and say, okay, we need a revised budget um, that shows how you're going to make it work with you know, $3,000 less than you asked for, etc. Or be able to go back to the well and say, actually, you gave us $3,000 less, but that's okay. We have this much community support that we can add back into the pool. Therefore, the project will go on as is. You want to make sure to document everything. You want to try to get as many data points as you can, meaning count how many people are there. If you can do an audience poll card, even better. Uh, find out where people are from. Have them check off, like I'm from this county or this county. Granting agencies want to know all that information and you want to check to see what your responsibility is for reporting afterwards as well. Um, okay, so back to <laughs> how to write a grant and the things you need. So the backup plan, absolutely, you need that. Um, double check looking for spelling issues. And again, it seems, I mean, we've all written papers. Um, but these grant applications, spell check doesn't always work when you're putting them into these things. They don't run off like Word. So I, we typically do ours on a Word doc so that we can see if spelling things come up. But I usually go back um, and try to read through the grant application out loud because I usually catch more, more issues, grammatical issues that way. Um, and again, as I mentioned in the beginning, do not wait until the last minute to write it. Um, Co-write the narrative with somebody else using a Google Doc and try to give yourself at least a month to bounce ideas off of each other. So um, I want to address a few other questions that people had asked um, in advance. <clears throat> uh, Joshua Thomas uh, said, what works, what doesn't, how to effectively act, is your own group manager and promote yourself with letting without letting it become a full-time endeavor. Yeah, no joke. Um, gosh, I wish I had great advice um, as to how to not let it become a full-time endeavor, but um, really what it is is I think we try to be careful about pre-planning um, two years in advance. Um, so we plan three to four large events per year uh, when we um, plan a season. Um, sometimes we'll plan a tour, like if the duo project, if Stuart, Stuart and I are gonna do a duo tour, that'll be extra and added on, but typically three to four projects spaced out throughout the year so that we know that we can control um, you know, aspects of it, like having enough time to learn the music, being able to plan the date so that it's not um, conflicting with the symphony schedule or the um, the opera schedule because a lot of our freelance musicians play in these groups in town. Um, you know, and just making it so it's not overwhelming because even just managing the projects, aside from grant writing, etc., just managing the projects is overwhelming um, sometimes. You know, coordinating the rehearsal times, can become like a full-time job, but we also are very clear as to whose job is what. I manage the books. I do all the accounting. Um, I'm the treasurer for the group. Um, we plan plan the concerts together and deal with logistics together, but I mean, Stuart is the one that knows everything about the electronics and he does like the hall booking because he deals with all the percussion equipment. I manage the money, the contracts, um, those kinds of things. So we have clear duties um, and, and try to deal with it that way. So, because we do actually both have full-time jobs outside of doing this. So um, that's one way we're able to manage it is really spacing out the concerts and only doing three to four per year, um, especially when we're doing big concerts. Like uh, we do fully staged operas sometimes and that's really, yeah, <laughs> we have to plan carefully um, there. Um, okay, let me come back. I see Brandon's got a question here, but uh, I want to answer. Um, Matt Taylor asked what my typical schedule is like. How do you balance the logistical responsibilities with the artistic? Um, definitely something I find difficult too, Matt, but um, trying to stay at least a year or two years ahead. And of course things change, but a year to two years ahead in programming decisions really helps. Um, Logistics become a nightmare, but we also have a really good board, um, board of directors and volunteer base. So we don't manage all of the logistics. That would be impossible. Um, we, we manage the ones that are, you know, right 
in the front of the stage, but we ha we have volunteers that do help. Um, and the artistic decisions are made well enough in advance that it doesn't become um, a juggling act in the moment, trying to juggle the logistics while, you know, planning the next concert, um, et cetera. So to me, sometimes the hardest part is that I, I get stuck uh, oh, artistically. I mean, don't we all at some point, it's like I, you run out of ideas or something. It's, you know, and of course, th there are always fresh ideas and fresh things to be had, but sometimes we feel like we get stuck in a rut. But that's the beauty of making sure that you're working together with somebody else um, to bounce ideas off of each other. Um, and you can kind of, you know, feed off of each other uh, for like, hey, that's a cool idea. And what if we did this too? And yeah, it's it's good to find someone who's on the same page. Um, and as Amy Williams always says, um, you got to find your people. And once you find your people, um, you know, you're, you're really able to to keep moving things forward. So, um, okay, Claire Sally says, where do you rehearse normally? How do you recommend finding a rehearsal space if you don't have access to something like that at a college? Uh, how much time a week do you put into bent frequencies, such as rehearsing, grant writing, finding gigs, and how do you balance that? Okay, so normally we rehearse um, at Georgia State because we're dealing with percussion oftentimes. We're in the basement at Georgia State because uh, Stuart has large rehearsal spaces down there and all the percussion gear is there. And we'll also use Copleff Recital Hall, so there at a college, right? But uh, we also sometimes give concerts not on college campuses. So we will find sort of underground art spaces like the bakery or iDrum when it was around. Um, and a lot of larger cities will have, you know, these kind of arts collectives where you can not even rent the space necessarily, but they take the door or part of the door or something. And you can sometimes um, arrange, you know, swaps for things where you are able to use their rehearsal space, um, especially if they are in kind of an industrial area. Sometimes they have, um, they're not Quonsets, but like open, uh, open, um, kind of unfinished spaces where you can set up and rehearse in there. If you need a piano, that becomes more difficult. But sometimes churches will let you use um, their space, uh, both in the recreation room as well as in the chapel if you need a piano. Um, you got to get creative when you need a piano. That's always a tricky one. But um, yeah, so, you know, if you're not at a college, you're, you're going to have to work something out. Maybe there is uh, a music center that you teach at where you could offer a trade, uh, meaning you get to rehearse there and you'll give one kind of benefit concert or something a year for their audience. Um, you can always work out some kind of trade in that way. Uh, how much time a week do I put into bent frequency? Well, depends on if it's grant season or not. <laughs> grant season always seems to come in the spring. Um, and in the spring, yeah, I spend uh, many an evening burning the midnight oil writing grants after I'm done work. Um, but, you know, in the summer and in the fall when it's not grant season, um, I'm only busy if I'm actually rehearsing and, and performing. So, you know, I mean, on average, I would say I probably spend 10 hours a week on average uh, working on, on bent frequency, sometimes far less. But, you know, in the off season, we're working on our website or we're working on gosh, a SoundCloud page or whatever. That's probably something we need to do soon. But uh, anyway, <laughs> um, finding gigs, yeah. I mean, that's also tricky. Typically, we're, we are um, touring as the duo. And so a lot of it is going to universities and giving master classes and performing a concert. But sometimes we're just looking for a series to play on. So like uh, the Milwaukee Unruly Music Festival, or we'll go to Omaha and do Omaha Under the Radar, or we'll do um, Cleveland for Noah Evans um, uh, series. Um, well, we're not doing anything this summer because everything's canceled, but um, yeah, so we just kind of look around for festivals. Um, we'll, we'll probably apply to do Splice at, in Athens at UGA this, this fall. Um, so we look for festivals and, um, yeah, that's, I hope that answers that question. If it doesn't, please 
clarify, Claire. Um, okay, Brandon, what do you find is an appropriate length for a grant description? Obviously, this might differ depending on the grant, but is there a point at which you find you are giving too much information? Yes. Okay, so oftentimes, uh, Brandon, you'll see that there, there will be a limit to how many characters you can include on the grant. Um, there are um, usually very, very specific um, descriptions. They'll say 2,500 characters and you want to double check that that's 2,500 characters with or without spaces um, because it's very hard to shorten something when you've gone way beyond the limit. So you set up a Word doc um, or a Google doc and what I like to do is, is, is set out um, the questions that are asked in the grant I highlight those in bold. I put very clearly underneath how many words, how many limit, uh, word limit there is. And then I keep a very close count, uh, word count as I'm writing the question. So usually it's better to say things as concisely as you can than to just ramble on and on and on, um, in your description. So it's always better to be, um, under the word limit then right at it because if you're right at it you cl you clearly have you know said something twice or have extra words in there so i usually like to try to keep it well under um the length but do check very carefully most grants um, specify very clearly um the word limit so yeah uh, speaking of rambling on, that's probably what I'm doing right now. So, um, I'll open it up if there are any questions, um, that anyone would like to ask about anything about contemporary music ensembles, which I find so much fun. Um, I love playing with different instruments. I mean, I love playing with saxophonists too, but, um, yeah, this is, this has been a part of my job. I've really loved learning how to manage a nonprofit run a contemporary music ensemble, um, balancing the checkbook, not so much, filing taxes, not so much, but um, I've definitely learned a lot uh, running this group. So uh, if there's anyone else that would like to ask any questions, I guess not. I rambled on so long that I answered them all. Uh, well, I will um, write uh, in those comments the list of those those places to check for grants. Um, and I will be happy to answer your questions if you think of something after the fact and want to send me an email um, about this. But um, yeah, it's it's definitely something a skill worth learning. And if you're in school right now, it's a school it's a skill worth learning now because we almost always have to apply for funding um, because it's not it's not every day that that people just call us up and say hey I'd like to hire you to come do X usually we're creating the opportunities ourselves um, as 21st century musicians no oh, Peter asks so oh, I got a couple info here what is your favorite 21st century ensemble instrumentation to play in oh my gosh that's a really tough question um, hmm that's a really tough question. Well, I mean, I like I like the idea of a modular ensemble, like not not necessarily like a fixed um, thing, because there's just so many timbres. I really have loved playing with percussion, um, mixed saxophone and mixed percussion, because there's so many sounds there. I'm kind of really digging the saxophone piano percussion um, trio. So um, I've loved some of those. Um, thanks for the question, Peter. I hadn't really thought about that. Um, that's a that's a good one. Uh, any other questions? Oh, thank you all so much. You're all so sweet and kind. I wish I could see you and talk to you in person, um, but it's been great. I want to thank Nate, um, Nathan Nab, uh, so much for um, uh, putting this all together. What a fabulous resource for our students. Um, I have to say, you know, I was overwhelmed thinking, how in the world am I going to you know, provide content for my students um, in this time. And, you know, Nate put this together and what an amazing resource for all of us because, you know, we can't all be experts in in, in everything. And so having um, 
all of these professionals uh, come on here and share their experience and expertise with our students and with each other um, is just so fabulous. So I can't thank you enough, Nate, for everything and for managing all details of this. So um, thank you all so very much. Oh, I see one more question in here, Nick. Um, oh, Jonathan, I missed your question. Sorry. Uh, do you or how do you set limits on your personal repertoire for the year? Yeah, no kidding. Um, <laughs> I have to say, I don't do a ton of solo performances um, anymore. It's mainly orchestral and then chamber music. But like I said, we plan one to two years out. Um, so we I very carefully make sure that not every single piece that Bent Frequency puts on has saxophone in it, Jonathan, because otherwise uh, I wouldn't be able to keep up. Um, so we have a large collective uh, of people who play in the group. There's like 13 or 14 people. And so, you know, I, I'll be listening to something awesome and say that is the most amazing flute and guitar piece ever. We're going to put that on a concert, you know, and I'm I'm very careful that I, I'm not on every single one of them. And sometimes I'm not on the concert at all. Um, so that's how I manage that part. Uh, Nick, how much outsourcing do you do for accounting legal consultation? Yeah, I don't. Um, yeah, we don't actually, we don't outsource any of the accounting. If you can believe it, I, I learned how to do the accounting um, myself. Legal consultation, we have a very good board of directors and we have a couple of lawyers who are actually on the board of Bent Frequency. So I do, we do ask them questions often, you know, when we have contracts, but we try to use like union type contracts that are tried and true. Um, but the accounting stuff, um, yeah, I do it. So that's not super pleasant. I wish we had the money actually to <laughs> hire out accounting. Um, yep. I know so much information, you guys, and I'm sorry, it's, you know, lots and lots of information. Again, I will write down some things uh, for you to look at. But um, Robert Beeson says, direct us to any written or online resources for grant writing. Yes, definitely go and um, check out GrantStation. Uh, GrantStation as well as Grant Space, And I'll write them down in the comments of this um, afterwards so you can all find them. There's some really great tips there for uh, online for grant writing. Um, also checking out your local arts councils because a lot of them will have advice too. Um, Noah, have you done any projects with students to help them gain these nonprofit skills? Yes. Um, indeed, Noah. Uh, a lot of times I will involve the students in projects like when we hosted uh, George Lewis last year, we tried to involve the students. We had a student concert as well as a professional concert. And, um, you know, a lot of the organizational things we left up to the students so that they learned how to how to logistically plan for things. I mean, we didn't leave the grant writing to them. I, I did. We did the grant writing, but. You know, a lot of it is teaching them, okay, let's start with the logistics, right? How do you create advertising for such a thing? How do you um, create a budget for such a thing? And how do you even book the plane tickets and get all that? Or, I mean, all from the beginning to the ending. Um, so we do, we do have um, students that do assist. I have had a couple of interns at Georgia State. Um, who kind of learned the ropes of the basics of grant writing and the basics of running a nonprofit. So they would come to our board meetings and help us with our like strategic plans and things like that so they could see things from that angle. Um, I never had anyone actually come in and write the grants, but um, you know, I, I ha we have encouraged them to go and take some of those grant writing classes to sort of learn on their own. Um, but yeah, I mean, trying to get the students to do something in the community th with these um, organizations that are, uh, you know, not at the school. Because in, in the end, when you leave school, where are you going to play? Uh, you're, you no longer have um, the recital hall at your school to play at. Where are you going to play? Um, and so, you know, having them be able to organize fundraiser concerts or, or whatever in exchange for using a space, um, it, that's just good experience to start there, you know, to start working um, in just in finding that piece of the puzzle. So th there are some things that we've done there. 
Uh, anybody else? Do you find it an uphill battle to convince non-saxophonists to jump onto works commissions featuring saxophone? Hmm. Um, no, I mean, you mean trying to convince non-saxophonists to perform in, in with the group? No, because I run the group. So <laughs> if I pay them, they'll play it. No, I'm just joking. Um, yeah, uh, not really, actually. Composers these days, um, you know, we are contacting them and saying, well, we have options. You can write for saxophone and percussion, or you can write for the larger bent frequency group. And most of them are super excited to include saxophone. And sometimes they get a little overzealous where they want to use all of the saxophones. And we have to actually restrict them to using one or two because you know, they, they're wanting it played by one person. Um, and that's always a nightmare, as we all know, <laughs> trying to switch horns in one piece. But no, actually, we've we've had um, really great luck in commissioning new pieces and, and having um, the performers that we play with all the time interested in playing, uh, you know, contemporary chamber operas that have saxophone. We've done a couple of them. And actually, uh, we performed... Uh, Ricardo Zan Muldoon, he teaches at Eastman, and he's such an incredible uh, composer. He wrote this amazing um, opera, what's well, more like a cantata, or I'm not even sure what he would classify it as, but um, called Kamala. And we actually played it here, and then we took it to the Cervantino Festival in Mexico. And uh, originally it didn't have saxophone in it. And when we told him the instrumentation of Ben Frequency, he actually sort of by request put in um, a couple of movements with saxophone. And now he loves it so much that he calls it um, the, you know, sort of the, the prime version that he prefers. So it was a fully written piece before without saxophone and um, he put it in because we had asked and now he loves it so actually we've we've had great luck it's different than I think the traditional world um, the traditional uh, uh, um, orchestral world although we're making headway there too I, I think the the expectations with chamber music um, are different so it hasn't been so bad no contrabass well I mean we have a contrabass at Georgia State but um, yeah, it's uh, not one that I play very often, I must say. So Awesome. Thank you all so very much. I hope you have a great weekend, and I appreciate you tuning in. Um, I'll, I'll write those places in the comments after the fact. And, you know, hopefully we're out of this quarantine soon and we can see each other face to face. But thanks again, and thank you so much, Nate, for organizing all of this. Um, we'll see you later.